Okay, that's the serious part of the evening over. Now we'll turn to uh, our educational portion, and we're going to be talking about 21st century mobility solutions. My instructions are very simple here. I have a fellow board member, Michelle Martinez, council member, city of Santa Ana. Uh, she's been on the council there since 2006, and I've enjoyed serving on the board with her, and she and I are staunch Facebook friends. So she knows what I'm up to, and I know what she's up to. And so with, with, that, with that introduction, there you go. Thank you, Welcome. Jay. And good evening to all of you. Did you guys all have a nice dinner? Yeah. Are you all awake? Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah, we have some amazing speakers, and I would be remiss if I didn't um, introduce a couple of people who sit with me, even in my role as a council member and a board member of LGC. I am also, you know, um, the vice president of the Southern California Association of Governments, and I have a couple of my colleagues in the room, and I would like to acknowledge them. Our president of SCAG, Cheryl Viegas Walker. We all know our very good friend back there, Pam O'Connor from Santa Monica. Yeah. And of course, we have our good friend um, as well from Oxnard. Carmen. And I'm, I'm searching the room just in case if I, I think that's it from us from that region. So with that being said, I think we're going to have, a, and I first want to, you know, I was just having some dialogue with these two um, amazing gentlemen that are going to be speaking about the 21st century mobility solutions. And I think for all of us that are in the room, and many of us are policy makers, as we look at wanting to make sure to have a reliable and predictable transportation network, we have to go beyond our traditional transportation networks. And today, what we're going to be discussing, and I think many of us in our communities are having these conversations and wanting to make sure that when we look at an Uber or a Lyft or we're looking and moving forward, as, as, as we all know, we're just having the conversations about autonomous vehicles, but also other alternatives like car to go and you have the zip car. Many folks, and, and, and I'm not going to say that maybe there's some of you in the room and maybe not, will, will tell you, is this the direction that we should be taking? Should the private sector be engaged or involved with government to provide reliable, predict predictable trans a transportation network? I would say yes. And I want to just give you some perspective from the jurisdiction that I come from in Orange County before we start this dialogue. When you look at a transportation network, in many respects, in a local municipality, you're part of a county regional system and you have transportation authorities. In Santa Ana, 34 percentage of our ridership is from the Orange County Transportation Public Bus System. We also have a huge percentage of people that are walking and biking in our city, not because of leisure, just because you know, if many of them could afford vehicles, they actually would not be taking the bus or riding their bikes or walking to get to work. But with that being said, Santa Ana has created a culture predominantly for the vehicle. If we look at our parking standards, when we work with our development community, we have set these high parking standards to create this culture. But now that we're talking about complete streets and wanting to provide reliable and predict predictable transportation, we're asking, should we provide active transportation and providing you know, safe bike routes and making sure that we have um, accessible you know, pedestrian paths for people to get to and from you know, their work or from home or from leisure. Some folks would say not everyone's going to use a system like that. I would tell you that in my community, they are using that system, but we have not provided that for them. We are now having the conversations about Uber and Lyft Currently, we have a, a transit um, um, center, the Santa Ana Regional Transportation um, Center, and we have an RFP, like many of you, for taxi service. 
right? And we now have Uber and Lyft in our community. And we're asking the question, should we lessen the regulations for taxis and opening up the conversation about making sure that this process is equitable so that just Uber and Lyft cannot just come into our communities and just you know start their, the, their business without having to go through a process. So I would tell you that conversations are being had in the city of Santa Ana, and I'm certain that they're, um, ha they're being had in your communities. But at the same time, I would tell you that first, last mile connections are vital for our community. How do we get people, whether they're using a light rail system or they're taking you know, other forms of public transportation, and how do we get them from that point A to point B, making sure that we're able to provide them with that reliable, predictable um, um, solutions to public transportation. And so when we start having these conversations about Uber, about Lyft, about car to go about bike share, and I know Long Beach just recently now has bike share, and they just opened that up. And in many communities, people are saying that may not work. Not everyone is going to want to participate in, and use this kind of system. I believe that if you are able to provide bike share or you're able to provide car to go, that's our role as policymakers to provide different alternatives so that folks can choose how they want to get from point A to point B. So with that being said, I, I, I do want to um, make this um, session very interactive with our speakers, and I will introduce them so that they can make some comment, but I want to make sure that the audience has some opportunity to share some best practices of what you all are doing in your communities. I just mentioned Long Beach. I know Santa Monica is doing some great things. Across the United States, we're seeing some amazing things being done, whether it's in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, and how we can partner up with um, whether it be an Uber or Lyft or providing car to go to our constituency. So with that being said, I would like to um, start off with introducing our first speaker, and that's going to be, um, I think, based on this order, or if, if not, I. I have Walter uh, Rosecrans, who's the Senior Business Development Manager for Car2Go, but maybe it's not him and it's <laughs> him. <laughs> he's the Senior Director of Sustainability for California Department of Transportation. So, uh, Stephen? <laughs> century mobility idea and I subtitled this climate change travel efficiency and technology that's how I'm kind of thinking about this and how my thinking has evolved over time what I'm going to do is actually give you a little bit of background about how Caltrans came to think about sustainable transportation but I actually no longer work at Caltrans I was recently uh, reappointed to a position at the Air Resources Board um, so this will actually be kind of fun because Caltrans can disavow all knowledge of anything else. <laughs> and I, I have to say that I don't speak on behalf of Mary Nichols in this presentation, so it's really just me. Um, I am going to be providing really a statewide perspective. I think it's still mostly accurate, um, and so I, I, but I do think it'll be, uh, you might hear a little more of my uh, own thinking as we go along, which might be fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I do want to just, providing that statewide perspective, I think it is kind of important. A lot of words, but my, my, my point here is that there are a lot of different mandates that drive how we think about transportation. Um, and these are primarily manifested in climate regulations uh, or climate legislation that, that uh, results in various regulations. So we have AB 32 which requires that we reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, transportation being something like 40 to 50%, depending on how you think about it, of greenhouse gas emissions in California. So obviously transportation is a big component of that. Digging down a little deeper into transportation is the Sustainable Communities Initiative under SB 375, which really is about how land use and transportation work together. All of you are probably quite aware of this since this affects you uh, in your sustainable community strategies that you have to put together. Um, SB 391 mandated that the state think about transportation planning from a climate perspective. SB 391 is pretty unique. It actually says, Caltrans, you've got to put together a transportation plan 
that says how you will achieve an 80% reduction in GHG emissions by 2050, 80% below 1990 by 2050. Very significant sort of mandate, and I think that's a, um, uh, you know, that really informed a lot of the work that I was doing while I was in Caltrans. SB 743, many of you are probably dealing with this right now as well. This changes the metric for transportation impacts from level of service to VMT. The um, regulations are sort of in process. There have been a couple of different draft regulations that have been put on the street. Folks have been commenting on those, and OPR is leading that draft regulation development that ultimately will turn into CEQA amendments. So that's, that's a, I think, an important part of the statewide perspective as well. And then lastly, this thinking about how do we pay for transportation going forward. There was a SB 1077 that said we should look at a vehicle miles traveled sort of approach to thinking about how we pay for transportation going forward. Can we move away from the gas tax uh, as we have more efficient vehicles using the gas tax? It's really not going to be the right way to fund transportation going forward. So what do we need to do to put something like a road charge in place? And so this, um, this is a pilot program to look at all of the issues that might be associated with developing a road charge and then um, moving forward with that. And then I'll just say lastly, of course, many of you are also very much aware of this, that there's a lot of active discussions about how to fund transportation when it's been deteriorating for the last several years since we don't have enough money to fix what we have. So this kind of conversation around what do we need to fix and how, and how to do that, how does that get funded, right? So these are all very active conversations. Um, in addition to that, there's sort of other requirements that really are on state agencies. These are mandates that aren't statutory, but they do have an effect on how the state does its business. These include the Caltrans strategic plan, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I was integrally involved in developing our strategic plan at Caltrans while I was there. Executive Order B30-15, which puts in place goals, GHG emission goals for 2030. So now we have AB32, which gives us a 2020 target. The B30-15 gives us give state agencies a 2030 target, and um, it also says that we need to be thinking about how we do our investments going forward using a life cycle approach and consider climate change when we do so. So this is something that state agencies are, are looking at. Uh, Executive Order B32-15, which says, okay, we know that we're gonna have to do emission reductions going forward. We need to, to comply with the Clean Air Act. But we don't want those mandates to have such great impacts on the freight system that we don't have a vibrant economy going forward. And we want to make sure that we've got freight as a vital part of our economy as we continue to, to grow in California. So this Executive Order B32-15 says, put together, it calls on all these state agencies to put together a sustainable freight action plan and develop pilot projects that can be implemented in you know, the near term that will actually move us on a path towards a sustainable freight system. As you can imagine, what does that mean? How do we define it? What are the pilot projects? What actions are state agencies gonna look at? These are all things that we as state administration departments are actually trying to work through and develop a sort of formalized structure for how we have those conversations, both publicly and internally. And then lastly, the state of the state five pillars. So these are, you know, to, to go towards more renewable energy, which has an effect on electrified transportation, um, reduced petroleum use, an obvious impact on transportation, um, existing buildings to double the energy efficiency. This is important because when you think about land use, we know that sprawl developments are, tend to have lower energy efficiency, per, certainly on a per acre basis and on a per capita basis, than infill development. So there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen around land use decisions that you know affect energy efficiency and how you can achieve these goals. Methane, black carbon, and other pollutants, there's impacts of transportation from each of these types of things. Uh, and uh, you know, how do we manage our open space in a way that helps it sequester or absorb carbon? So that's another kind of land use decision that has ties to transportation.
So all of these really inform the work that we do at the state. We think about transportation as this kind of uh, this complex system where all of these things affect each other. You've got technology, infrastructure, fuel use, land use that all are interwoven and each has some impact on the other. Well, at Caltrans, uh, this was about a year ago, we developed this strategic plan to think about how we do our transportation work going forward. And the strategic plan was a five-year look, but really with a 25 or 30 year horizon, understanding where we need to go. And as we were developing that plan, we, I apologize, the slide here is a little messed up, uh, we developed a new mission and goals that would, that would help drive what we were trying to accomplish. So our mission was to, or still is, <laughs> to provide a safe, sustainable, integrated, and efficient transportation system to enhance California's economy and livability. It really kind of gets at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. It's not just about getting people from here to there. It's about understanding that why you want to get them there is to enhance the economy. You're doing transportation because it's important for social benefits. It's important to serve society. And you have to do that in a way that recognizes that these go through communities, that there's impacts and benefits, and all of those things are very much interwoven. So the five goals that we developed, including the sustainability goal, which I was working on specifically, include safety and health and stewardship and efficiency, sustainability, livability and economy, system performance, and then as, a, as an organization wanted to, to incorporate organizational excellence into the work that we do. So we define this in kind of these three ways, people, planet, prosperity. Sustainability, if you know, those of you who are familiar with this kind of term, typically thought of as the three E's or the triple bottom line. This is equity, the environment, and, and the economy. In Caltrans, we recognized that that wasn't resonating for folks inside the building. So we changed it. We said, okay, look, we're doing transportation fundamentally because it's about people. And we want to do it because it enhances the economy. So that's prosperity. And we know that we need to be doing this in a way that reduces the very significant impacts that transportation can have on the environment, so the planet. So we, we put all these together, kind of develop this, this framework with these three objectives, and use that to help inform our decision making. And then we define the sustainability goal as make long-lasting smart mobility decisions that improve the environment, support a vibrant economy, and build communities not sprawl. Was the state DOT, and I think all DOTs are really this way, and uh, I, you know, this is, this is a, a way to think about how we measure the progress of our work, we wanted to def define performance measures. So we defi define these, these 12 performance measures, including mode shift, an accessibility metric, a livability metric, and um, a way to uh, think about our integrated uh, frameworks for sort of planning and implementing transportation in a sustainable way. So that, that had sort of a specific metric defined. Um, per capita VMT, uh, GHG emission reductions, operational emission reductions, that is our internal, our internal operations. Uh, a green infrastructure score as part of a livability element. You want to think about green infrastructure. Freight efficiency, resiliency, and reduced resource consumption and prosperity. So these were kind of the 12 different metrics that we defined, and each of those has a target associated with it. So this is all in this strategic plan. Well, the targets are pretty aggressive, and so the, the state DOT recognizes that what we have to do is think about transportation much differently in the 21st century. We can't use the old way of building transportation corridors that accommodate endless growth because there's environmental impacts that we have to consider and there's economic impacts that we have to consider. So the, there were fairly aggressive goals, bike, uh, to triple bike um, mode share, to double, and, to double pedestrian and transit mode share, uh, for example, to reduce per capita BMT by 15%. Uh, reduce uh, uh, GHG emissions consistent with AB32 and, and B30-15 and so forth. 
So the way I think about this is really that you know, this system has a variety of different inputs, right? And ultimately, what, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about transportation is this kind of open road concept. The reality is this is what we get. We don't see the open road most of the time, right? In our, in our urban areas, we're stuck in traffic. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 the congestion has impacts to our economy. It has impacts to livability, and it has impacts to the environment. And this kind of infrastructure that we continue to develop really isn't going to be very ambitious for what we're trying to accomplish. By the way, this is this is not a real photo. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I have to say it. So. It is kind of a piece of it's actually, I believe, an interchange in Woodland that uh, was uh, photoshopped. Yeah, yeah. It's, still, it's still kind of fun. So I, I mentioned GHG emissions. This is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, when there was an economic downturn, the fuel use declined. But more recently, it's increasing. So the real question is, how are we going to think about this going forward? And so that's why I come back to this idea about climate change, travel efficiency, and technology. Those are the things that really uh, drive me to think about how we're going to ultimately pull ourselves out of this, uh, uh, maybe a, a mess that we've created. So how do we think about travel efficiency? Many of you have probably seen this slide. If you think about the, the, the automobile, you, if you had, say, 200 people on a, on a street, they could commute in cars, right? So that looks just like this, but all those people have a big uh, metal box around them. Or a few buses, one light rail train, or a series of bikes. So when you're thinking about efficiency, the car isn't versus the train or a car against bike, it's just that sometimes the car is the best way to get where you need to go, and sometimes it's not. But what we've done is we've sort of accommodated this endless growth in automobile travel in such a way that we haven't really accommodated the other types of travel that can be more efficient and that probably provide enhanced community livability, certainly environmental benefits, and health benefits. So as Michelle said, a lot of people are wanting to walk and ride their bikes. They want an efficient transit system that's on time, <laughs> that meet, you know, that, that reliability is absolutely key. We don't have reliability when we have congestion. We don't have it when we have transit. I know if I, if I need to get somewhere and I know exactly how long it's gonna take, the bike is definitely the way to go because I know exactly how long it's gonna take and I'm never out on a bike trail where it's too congested for me to ride as fast as I can, you know, up and up. Michelle talked about complete streets as well, and if you think about sort of the standard boulevard, right, this is a, a fairly inefficient model. You look at this, these land uses, we're not ma maximizing or optimizing what we could be doing. We've accommodated a lot of space for vehicles. Uh, we have a few businesses, we put a lot of parking in, but there's a lot of kind of open space that isn't really being well utilized, that isn't also really park space either. So what if we have more vibrant communities through this transportation system that is more accommodating and actually encourages active modes so that you get people out, they're shopping, they're, they're commuting, they're actually interacting with their neighbors. And furthermore, if you can now turn some of those spaces into areas that when it's not needed, then you can use for other purposes like farmer's markets or these types of like you know, craft fairs and these sorts of things that that pop up, yeah, cars are going real slow now. It's not efficient for cars, but that's not the point. That's a lot of land that can be used for something good, and we need to recognize that sometimes driving cars on it isn't necessarily the best use. I'm gonna switch a little bit here to talking about uh, you know, technology, and I think that technology is gonna be really critical going forward. So I'm just going to talk quickly about a couple of things. Um, I love this photo because it it really is back to the future. These, uh, I think they were uh, Buicks, 
if I've got that right, or Oldsmobile. Back in 1997, this was the first test of automated vehicles on I-15, where there was uh, embedded sensors in the road that these vehicles would, would follow. So this isn't really new technology. We're talking about 1997 here. It hasn't evolved that much since then. I mean, more recently, we know a lot about vehicle automation, and, and, and I guess the evolution has really exploded, but up until the last five years, it was pretty stagnant. So this type of technology going forward is going to be really interesting to follow. I think that, I mean, maybe in, in question and answer, we can talk a little bit more about that and get more into my, my specific thoughts on it. Uh, I do think that automated vehicles done right can have real benefits to communities. Done wrong, I'm deathly afraid of them. So maybe I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and then sort of automated buses and trucks, they can, you know, this is a, a sort of a transit idea, right? If you have automated closed loop systems uh, for buses, those are fairly common now. Um, those work really well. Uh, what about automated buses out on the open road? Um, I saw the movie Speed, so maybe that's, <laughs> that's not, the, not the best uh, model. Um, but, you know, for trucks, and I'll, and I'll kind of just uh, jump to that a little more on transit, but uh, also for trucks, the, the key thing here is that connected vehicles uh, with, you know, sort of off once automation and connected vehicle technology kind of melds together or morphs into one, then there can be a lot of efficiency benefits that we can gain. And for, for freight, I think that's especially true. So in the Sustainable Freight Action Plan, we're thinking a lot about how do we get more efficiency out of that existing system? You know, back to that slide where I showed the 200 people in a bunch of 177 cars, that's not really efficient. So automation can have benefits where you can right size uh, and can have benefits where, um, uh, especially for freight, where you can you know, get more efficiency out of the existing system. We know we're not going to be able to afford endless investments. So you know, when we can't even fix it now, right? Uh, and so given that that's the case, what I think we really need to be thinking about is getting the most efficiency out of the existing system that we have. And then really thinking carefully about how that expands and what the best type of investment is going forward, given all these things that we know. So I think I'll leave it there. Hopefully that didn't take too long. And back to Michelle. Thank you. So now we'll have Walter Roskrans, he's a Senior Business Development Manager for Car2Go. Thank you. It's really hot. It's great for me coming from San Diego. Thanks for feeling out. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, <coughs> council member. Uh, again, Walter with Cardigo, and some of you out there I know probably are familiar with Cardigo and what the concept is. But for those of you that may be newer to car sharing, is this okay? All right, I'll try and speak up a little louder. Okay. Um, for those of you that are, that are newer to car share, I'll kind of go through what the concept is. But uh, Cardigo, it's a point-to-point -point car share system. And basically, there's three different models that are out there in the market right now. There's a traditional car share, station-based car share, where a car lives in a home, it lives in a parking spot, and then you rent it by the hour um, out of that spot, and then you return it to that same location. And you can reserve them, I believe, up to a year in advance, so it's great. Uh, if you know you have to have a car at a certain specific time, then it's really effective for that. And now, uh, just recently, uh, Zipcar actually is a, a good example of that model. City Car Share also an example of that model. And Zipcar just recently started a program where they're doing a point-to-point -point with a uh, fixed station. So it does have some flexibility. You can pick up a car in one fixed station, take it to another fixed station in the round. Uh, they piloted that in Boston last year, I believe, and then they just announced, I think it was a couple weeks ago, or maybe last week, where they are going to be doing that in Los Angeles. And then you have a free-floating car share concept. 
and that's where the cars can just be picked up and dropped off anywhere within a defined geographic area, and that's what Car2Go is. So all of this technology is enabled by the apps now. So with the smartphones, all the cars have cell and GPS technology in them. So uh, with our system, we put a large network of cars within a defined geographic area, and typically it's 20 to 30, maybe 40 square miles. And then the members just rent them wherever it's convenient for them. So they get their app, they find the uh, nearest car to them, it's going to be parked on the street in most cases, and through the app they can enable a rental right there, take it to another on-street parking place within the, the home area, and the rental and walk away. Uh, so it's that true flexibility point-to-point -point system. Um, we built by the minute, so the member only has to pay for the time that they're driving from point A to point B. And just like with the other car share models, insurance, fuel, maintenance, and all that is included. And uh, we started about five, six years ago as a pilot in Austin. It comes from Germany. It was originally started in 2008 in Germany. Uh, but now we're up to 13 markets in North America with uh, 30 markets worldwide. And it's, it's been pretty successful this. Uh, members have really adopted it as part of their transportation mix. And it's not, we know we don't solve everybody's problems. We don't provide a one-stop solution. But it's having that flexibility to have this type of a model, plus a fixed or traditional car share model, plus transit, biking, walking, that really helps people um, get around. And we view our competition as the personal car. You've also got your Uber and Lyft out there. They're serving a great purpose. The more flexibility people have to get where they want to go without having a personal car, they can start shedding those cars. So if we look to see who uses our system, uh, it's kind of what you would expect. Um, we have members, if you're a full-time student, you can register at 18. And then we have members in their 80s that are using the system. Uh, I was in the San Diego office this week and there was a gentleman in his 70s that was in the office getting signed up. They, the, the empty nesters, they're moving into town. They're taking advantage of that active lifestyle. They're seeing, I don't necessarily need a car. So they're taking advantage of these services as well. But there is that sweet spot. It's that mid 20s to mid 30s, generally pretty tech savvy uh, because with these types of technologies, it does take a smartphone in order to use the systems. Um, but, you know, most everybody has a smartphone these days. And as we see how they use it, um, really it's how you would use a personal car, but with some benefit of flexibility. So with the point-to-point -point system, Again, the, most of our rentals are from one point to another point. Our average rental is less than a half hour. And they may be coming back. They may be going to dinner, going to see a concert or a show or something, and they're coming back from where they started, but they're gonna end the rental and not have to pay for that car during that event, and then they just grab a different car and come back. Um, the way they use it or what they use it for, recreational activities, social activities, a lot of times they're going out to meet their friends at the restaurant, their friends may be bringing them home, so again, that's that benefit of, they're still doing multimodal. They may be driving, taking a transit to work, service workers are getting off late, uh, transit may not be convenient for them when they're getting off, so they're looking for these other alternatives as, as a way to get home. Um, in some cases, they're going out for the evening. They know that they may or may not be in a condition to drive when they come back. So they take our service to go out and then take the other services to get back. And also, it's interesting, some people do use it for work. Uh, I would say it's not certainly not the highest usage, but people do commute with our cars. Um, the frequency spectrum is really interesting because we don't have, it's not a subscription-based type service. So you sign up once and then you have the membership for as long as you want. So we have people that they have a car. 
they drive 90% of the time in their own personal vehicle, but their car may be in the shop, or they're going somewhere where they know they don't want to bring their car home. So then they use our service. Up to people that this is part of their mix. They're using these services exclusively. They don't have cars, or they've cut down on a car, uh, so they've gone from a two-car to a one-car household. And as we all know, you guys live this every day, more and more people are moving into the cities. So that's where the challenge is becoming. How do you move all those people around the city efficiently? Whereas, you know, a lot of people are used to using that personal car. So this is where these services playing in conjunction with the existing transit networks, biking, walking, um, taxis, can provide that spontaneous mobility that can get people out of their personal vehicle. There's a lot of research that's been done on traditional car share, where for each individual traditional car share that goes into service, from six to 13 personal vehicles come out of the system because people are switching over to using these shared cars. All that's doing is removing all that, that dead inventory, those cars that park all but one hour a day at the most, taking those out to use, uh, to put in cars that are moving a lot faster and more frequently. So that frees up the parking in those communities. Another nice thing about these systems, point-to-point um, -point car share or, or the uh, kind of fixed point-to-fixed -fix point, if it's tied in with transit, is a great solution for finding that uh, first and last mile. A lot of time, transit's effective if you're within close reach to that transit station and having access to it. Sometimes it's not as convenient. So having these types of systems to get to uh, the transit locations. I know in San Diego, again, from there, there's the coaster, which runs from North County down into downtown San Diego. There's a lot of members that we've talked to that said, there's always something that happens. I have an appointment or there's something going on. I've got a child that may or may not be sick. I just feel like I need to have that flexibility to get home. Or my workplace is just outside of range of transit, so I can't go there. But now they're able to take transit down into downtown, grab a car to go or Uber or whatever, get to their workplace and back, and then not have to fight that I-5 traffic. So again, it's all part of that mix. And actually, we've heard quite a few people have been able to shed cars because of that. So in New York, uh, we have a program in Brooklyn and just expanded to Queens. About one in four car to go trips ends near a uh, subway station there. 54% of our members use transit at least once a week, and almost half of them have it at transit pass. Seattle, it's kind of crazy. That's a really busy market for us. Over 86, or about 86% of our members have a transit pass that are using our system. So car share, it's kind of here to stay. Um, I've been with the company for over five years, and when I first started, we had just launched the program in Austin. We were getting ready to launch Vancouver. Um, Uber and Lyft didn't exist. Uh, a lot of these technologies weren't even out there. And now <clears throat> the forecasts are by 2020, there'll be 12 million car share members. And even the OEMs now are getting into it, which uh, GM announced recently that they're starting a car share program. Uh, BMW has a car share program. Ford is working on partnerships. So it may sound counterintuitive, why are auto manufacturers that are in the business of selling cars, supporting programs, that get rid of cars? Um, but Daimler, which Cartago is a sub of Daimler, a wholly owned sub of Daimler, saw, especially in Europe, it's harder and harder to have a car. In the urban centers, sometimes there's access fees just to get into the urban center. So why are you gonna have a car? So, they're making a shift from providing cars to providing mobility. And in order to stay relevant, as more and more people are moving into the cities, they're seeing that, okay, how can we provide this mobility to the community? And um, 
I'll leave this you with this quote um, from our our the Daimler head of mobile or head of uh, chairman of Daimler. Um, as we look to the future, you know, there's a couple of things happening. One, there's a lot of spread out services that are all individually marketed and individually transacted. So there's a big opportunity now, you're starting to see it where there's a reduction in the friction or the, the transactions to move from one mode to another. So, you know, picture in another couple of years, your phone does everything and you don't have to really plan anything. You go from the bus to a bike share to a car share and it all, the ticketing just automatically happens. So you don't have to plan all that in advance. It's really getting to that uh, wing it mentality where no matter where you are, you can just wing it. I can get where I need to go just with the options that are out there without having a car. And then thinking further down the road, autonomous cars. Um, that's going to be a fascinating discussion and how things are going to progress with autonomous vehicles. And maybe we'll get into a little more of that, but um, the companies are committed to this. They're seeing that car share is kind of in maybe 1.5, we're not, maybe not at 2.0 yet. Uh, we're, we're kind of getting there. But once autonomous comes, that really changes the, the game and how this, these services operate. 